All right. Welcome, podcast listeners. I am excited for this episode. And I'll tell you what, a little backstory real quick before I invite our guest to uh, share a little bit about herself. But this episode is, is a result of connecting on social media. Guess what, y'all? Social media is not just a place for, for drama and politics. It's a place for genuine, good quality connection. And makes me happy to to have our guest with us today as a result of Instagram. Hillary, thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for naming that the social media. Probably a year and a half ago, I didn't know what Instagram was, but I've now become active and joined the and I, I find too the same. Um, and I, when I reframe for myself that social media is there to help connect good people and share good ideas, I do find it to be very helpful. Absolutely. I, I try to have that same intentional approach to social media. If not, you get you get pulled down these dark alleys and me intentionality. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're getting sidetracked. I love this, though. This is going to be a great episode. Um, for our listeners and actually for me too, because we just chatted for a little bit before hit and record. I'd love to know a little bit more about your background. I heard elements of working with veterans. Am I across the, the country training? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a clinical social worker and also a clinical addiction specialist. I've been a member of the MENT, Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, for a decade. Um, I have done a wide variety of work, but all of it, I, I like to use the term helping professional because I think that that describes what so many people are doing across different disciplines. So I've been a helping professional for 20 years. Um, I did sort of... Um, cut my teeth or get a lot of experience working in the VA medical center for almost a decade working with veterans. I've been on my own in private practice and business uh, training and consulting for six years and really have enjoyed that process of supporting individuals and organizations at gaining effective and compassionate communication skills. I mean, that's really what my mission is, is to bring the tools of MI, the effectiveness and the compassion that that brings to as many people as are interested. Wonderful. And uh, we could probably spend a whole episode just learning about and those capturing those lessons learned from your experience. And uh, we could talk veterans too, which we might have to have you back for an, a veteran focused episode. Sure. Well, let's talk MI because that that's what jumped out at me was the great work you're doing with MI. And on earlier episodes, I kind of shared my story when I was a campus police officer and how I, I kind of got pulled into the MI world. Mm -hmm. What was your journey to MI like? Well, I was fresh out of graduate school working for the VA as a young clinical social worker. And I was really high in my enthusiasm. <laughs> and that really carried me into what many helping professionals fall into, which is working really hard for people, um, coming up with ideas for people and creating plans for them without taking the time to truly engage, to really listen and to, and to evoke, you know, their motivations for change. So I found myself um, at my first MI training and there was that moment in the training where it clicked for me when I realized that, that I had been carrying this burden of responsibility for change for others on my shoulders, like a backpack. And I, I set it down. When I learned MI, I set it down <laughs> and I still have to keep setting it down because I think that I have a tendency and helping professionals have a tendency that comes from that really good place of wanting to help of, of kind of taking over. Um, so when I returned to my work after that training, I had that sort of felt sense of like, oh, this burden of responsibility of change, it's the clients, it's not mine. And, and as I, um, what's that phrase? Uh, learn it, do it, teach it. As I have learned and practiced and taught motivational interviewing, it continues to reiterate and solidify this process of, of really believing in clients and wanting to know what their motivations are to connect with them. 
as the vehicle for change rather than taking over, uh, fixing, doing for them, coming up with plans for them, and then getting frustrated that they're not following it. So I, I kind of want to share a little bit about my first experience with MI because you might see some similarities. So I was a police officer and I went to basics training, brief alcohol screening intervention for college students. I was a police officer, so I stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> The end of the second day of training, the instructor wanted to do sort of a, a role play scenario and nobody volunteered to be the, the college freshman for that conversation. So guess who got voluntold they were doing it? <laughs> I did. And I actually haven't really shared this much about the story publicly. But when I was role playing as that college freshman, it hit me and I got to experience MI and what it felt like, but I was able to resonate so much with that college freshman. And I was still on my, my roller coaster working through my post-traumatic stress and my drinking behaviors, wanting to change, but that sort of yo-yo back and forth, trying to and not being successful. But the folks in the room didn't realize, but I wanted to tear up when I was mm -hmm. just role playing, but that's how powerful it was. And gosh, I was hooked right out of the gate. Right. You could feel in that moment and resonate with the ambivalence that a client experiences about change and connect like, hey, this feels really good. It feels good to talk with someone who is using MI. Um, yeah, what a beautiful example. So when I started using MI on patrol and as a police officer, it was just that. The, the students liked talking to me. Like, <laughs> wait a second, since when do people like talking to the cops, let alone college students like talking to the cops? <laughs> it, it was a, a beautiful thing, but can you tell me, you know, in the work you're doing now, who are some of your clients? Who are your typical clients and what are they doing with MI? It's a very wide target. You know, I actually had a patrol officer and a sergeant in a recent training of mine. And that was the first time I'd had. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> that makes my heart dance. happy right there. Yeah. <laughs> right. I have educators and trainings early early childhood had start. Um, I have nurses and prescribers, psychiatrists, doctors. I have a lot of therapists um, and um, as well as peer supports and case managers, people who work in ministries or other case management services um, that are really high in drive for compassion and wanting to help, but have had less years of school <laughs> that kind of mm -hmm. um, you know, train people in effective communication styles. I actually love that Bill Miller said, um, anybody can learn MI, even psychologists. Ooh, I feel like I need a little <laughs> drum snap. I don't, oh. Yep, he's a psychologist, but right. Ooh. And I and I find that myself that no matter what education um, people are coming to learning MI with, that anyone can learn it with a willingness and a desire and practice. And, um, you know, you named your early training experience, um, that practice session that you did is what we call a role play instead of a real play. So you are role playing that example. We do a lot of role playing and real playing when we train a motivational interview because we want folks to experience what you experienced, what it feels like to be on both ends of those conversations. And that's usually the moment in trainings of buy-in, you know, where folks say, oh my gosh, this feels good this works. Like I want to bring this to my clients because people are drawn to the helping professional because we want to help. So you, you have a, a good list, a, a good roster of clients, folks that you're training in MI. Let's talk a little bit about why they want to learn MI and how they actually use it. Mm -hmm. People are drawn to MI, well, for several, from several kind of areas, people are drawn because it's an evidence-based practice and someone told them they need to learn it. <laughs> mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. are drawn sometimes because they see colleagues using MI and they say, how are you getting somewhere with that client? <laughs> how, how are you working with the like quote difficult or 
more resistant to change folks and it's working. And so they want it. They want some of that. They want to get the skills um, to do that. Um, other people are drawn to MI because they see how it can really lighten their burden of responsibility. And you and I know, um, and everyone listening to this podcast is in the helping profession in some way. Uh, we are, there's a lot of demands from us right now. We are working hard to support people and um, anything that can help us work a little lighter and be a little more effective and efficient um, is a good thing. Um, so let me see, go back to your question. It was what draws people? Yeah, and how are they using MI? Using it. Mm-hmm. And many people have been drawn to MI in the substance use or misuse world because that's that's where MI birthed from, you know, in the early 1980s. Um, so I work with a lot of folks who work in addiction and substance misuse and harm reduction. Um, so they are using it. I mean, you really could take kind of any of the different disciplines I just named and then name where that can be used. And I'd love to hear, you know, you, you have mentioned... Um, as an officer campus police using it to connect with mm -hmm. students, to connect with people, to have effective, engaged conversations that may get more to the heart of what's going mm -hmm. on instead of being that punitive role. Um, where else do you utilize MI? Ooh, I like this. Get two folks that know MI and we just start asking each other questions. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, so just some fun stories, uh, very memorable stories for me when I would use MI on patrol. When So I loved foot patrol. A lot of the other officers wanted to be in the squad car. They wanted to be patrolling and responding to calls. But I, I, I found energy in just having conversations and connecting with the students. And so when I worked second shift so until midnight, I would walk foot patrol and just strike up conversations with students in the residence hall lobbies. Students are hanging out, playing games on the big TV, walking. And on a college campus, it's not hard to bring up drinking or substance use and just casual conversation. And it was great to be able to just sort of on the fly, have some, some real conversation with students about drinking, whether they said, yeah, they do drink or no, they don't, but gosh, there's somebody on their floor that's always having people over and causing a ruckus uh, made for just good conversations. And actually one, one little story, and then I'm, I'm going to throw questions back at your way. Um, football game. I was tasked with standing at one of the entrances where two student workers were collecting tickets as people entered the stadium. My job stand there, look tough and make sure there are no problems. Okay. That's boring. <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, but I overheard the, so it was a guy and a gal students and the guy, it, it sounded like he was trying to flirt with the girl. He was talking about his drinking behavior, how his friends called him a wobbly giraffe, big, tall guy, athlete. And he gets drunk. He can't stand up. And so I was like, Ooh, Hey, let's have a conversation. So we just started you know, having a, what felt like to them, just a real conversation. And before the end of it, the three of us were having a conversation about the, the dangers they were sharing. Oh, maybe I shouldn't get that drunk. I'm an athlete. What if I fell and blew my knee out or hit my head? There goes my, my college career, my scholarship. And I'm not telling any of these things. I'm just asking questions, mm -hmm. but it was. It was a rewarding conversation. Just heard somebody bring up alcohol, brought up their drinking behaviors. Right. That. Yeah. I just right. went back to that moment. If you saw my face, I was like, ah, that was cool. I have no right. idea where I was going to go with this conversation, but it was, it yeah. was powerful. You, you yeah. engaged with them and there was a topic that he was willing to talk about. 
And through those skills of MI, the active listening and the reflections and evocative questions, um, he was able to name some of the risks of the drinking. And we can hear how kind of traditionally that conversation might have sounded very different. The warning, the threatening, the scolding that can happen. And that so many young people are used to receiving from mm-hmm. teachers, educators, um, et cetera. Um, so, right, for us to listen instead of tell, for us to evoke instead of impart, um, these are important pieces uh, to the change process that we've really learned are really significant. When, when you have a, a new training participant, um, a teacher, or somebody that's not previously trained in counseling or MI, one of the things that I, I've experienced is they say, people are always coming to me for advice. They're, they're sharing problems and wanting me to, to help them, to mm-hmm. tell them what to do. And one of the things they love about MI is that it's perfect there. They don't have to be that expert. Is that something you, you see often with, with a lot of your participants? Absolutely. And you can just feel there how that burden of responsibility for others is on Mm -hmm. the helping professional. When someone comes to us and says, help me, tell me what to do. um, Mm -hmm. Through this MI spirit and lens, I don't believe I have the best ideas for you. So let's talk together and pull that out. You know, sometimes I think of it like, um, you know, like a dopamine hit in our brain, right? When we're a helping professional and we kind of give that piece of advice or do that thing for somebody, it like gives us that hit in our brain of like, I did it. Like I could put my Superman cape on and like, I'm awesome. You know, it gives us that reinforced kind of feeling. Um, What we actually want is for our clients to feel that sense of hit that sense of accomplishment of like, I figured it out. I have it inside of me. I'm more connected, you know, and that that's really what we want. Um, so, you know, when you ask about how, you know, how are people that I train using MI, it is so varied, you know, I, as I see people who work in classrooms and education integrate it. They are, they are working less hard to manage difficult behaviors. They are more effective at conversations with parents or with colleagues. Um, there are really significant shifts that happen. Um, and I could, I could tell you a story for really probably every single different discipline, you know, that I've worked with and even how people, integrate motivational interviewing into their personal stories. I worked with a a psychiatric prescriber. Um, He was in one, one of my trainings and he, he shared initially just how, what a relief it was and how much more effective conversations he was having with patients as he was integrating MI skills into practice. And then he shared a story that um, he and his family had a a parent who was um, needing memory care you know, the dementia was, um, as getting pretty significant and, um, his mom and his dad did not want her to go into memory care. And it was evident to everyone else that this was something that needed to happen. Um, and so he was playing this role in his family of facilitating a really difficult conversation with his dad. And he noticed his, his, uh, brother's, we're taking that stance that so many of us fall into that writing reflex, where we try to convince or persuade change. And that was, I mean, literally he could watch his dad's resistance increasing as his siblings were arguing. And uh, when he was able to step into that role of having an exploratory conversation with his dad about it, evoking from his dad, some of his concerns about the mom continuing to live there, you know, he was able to help them come to a place where, his dad could be ready to move on, right? So that's just a personal kind of story of all the different ways these this approach can show up for folks. Absolutely. And I was uh, doing a training in Kansas City and at the, the start of it, you know, I kind of was asking folks what drew them to attend. And, and one, one lady said, I gotta be honest with you, Dave, I'm, I'm a prevention professional, but today I'm wearing my mother hat 
That's right. what drew me today. I was like, oh, hey, I love it. Thank, like, this is going to be a great training. Let, let's mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. And that's why she was there. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the writing reflex. Um, God, oh, ongoing battle for me so hard for its human nature. Um, mm -hmm. For some of the listeners that might not be familiar with that, how would you describe that? What is the writing reflex? <laughs> Um, it is that tendency. And I, sometimes I feel it like a physiological response where I want to sort of sit forward and jump in. You know, I feel that tightness in my body to like, I'm going to fix this. But it's that physiological response, that response where we um, want to fix, persuade. You know, when someone is doing something that is hard to see or doesn't make sense to us, or we want to see changed, um, we tend to jump in to try to, you know, argue for that person to change. Um, what we know is that when someone is ambivalent about change and we argue for change, that it tends to kick up psychological reactants, that tendency that they're going to argue against it, just human nature again. And so we see ourselves arguing for change and the other arguing against it. I had a real clear example of this working with a young man who was um, struggling with some opiate addiction and um, he was talking to me about a trip that he was planning and, um, it sounded to me like a sort of a planned relapse. He knew that this person he wanted to go visit used, et cetera. And my read, my writing reflex kicked in right away because I am feeling the, you know, that alarm of like, don't do this. This is dangerous. You know, this is a bad idea. And as soon as I started arguing for change, like, I'm concerned about that. This doesn't sound like a good idea. He kicked back with, it's not that bad. I don't, you know, he's arguing to go. And that is always a cue to me as a provider. When I'm arguing for change and the client's arguing against it, then I'm in the wrong chair. <laughs> that I'm actually making it worse. I'm actually causing them to argue against change, which solidifies they're not change. <laughs> they're not changing. Mm -hmm. So I had to swap, you know, swap places in that moment and say, do some reflecting. You're, you've been excited about this trip. You've been thinking a lot about it and then do some evoking. What concerns might you have about going? Right. And so that I can begin to have him arguing for the change rather than me, because the more people, you know, talk, the more they learn what they believe and become connected to that. And that impacts behaviors. Great story. Great example. And I love the awareness as a practitioner. I I have to remind myself, I catch myself all the time. And that, that's never going away. I'm going to always have to try to catch myself and avoid the writing reflect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's. I wrote a blog post recently that I'm in MI recovery because to me, it's like a recovery program. I was talking to a training participant actually who called to sort of ask like, what training is right for me? And um, he said, I'm, I'm a substance use professional. I'm burned out. I'm getting resentful that I'm doing all this work and people aren't, you know, doing the work. And, um, and, uh, and I, and I was talking some about my trainings because I do a lot of live skills practice and a lot provide folks with a lot of opportunity to do weekly practice. And I said, I really see this as like a recovery process. Like if we're working with someone in substance use and they are trying to stop using substances they may go to meetings. They may go to meetings every day. They may go to groups or church services or whatever that is that supports their recovery or their abstinence, if that's what they're aiming for. And for me, the process of becoming a trainer has been like that continued in my recovery because every time I'm showing up to train others, I'm reminding myself to stay out of that writing reflex I am practicing the spirit of MI of compassion and acceptance and evocation and curiosity of clients, because those are not my natural places to go. My natural places are to go, to go, or to think that I've got great ideas for people. And if you would just do what I said, then things would work out great for you. <laughs> so a little, little meta thought just occurred to me. That's why my eyes mm -hmm. got real big. With MI, we're, we're helping folks sort of articulate, understand, and build towards their own change. 
but then also as practitioners, as we are learning MI, we are trying to, to change the way we communicate, almost change nature, human nature of how mm. we communicate. So we're on our own journey of change as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I see that too, when I work with large implementations and systems, um, when I'm working with, you know, the supervisors who are learning MI and who are learning to use motivational interviewing in supervision and organizationally, that there is a huge parallel process between how they show up and how they communicate with their staff and how their staff show up and communicate with clients. There's actually a, a relatively new book, um, Motivational Interviewing for Helping Professionals, what's the title of it? Helping professionals, Organizational Leaders, that speaks to this very piece is like um, the, the multi-levels of change that can go on when we're really truly integrating motivational interviewing into organizations. And yes, that's a part of um, the need for that continued MI practice and recovery, so to speak, for me is a part of what I'm, my passion for what I'm doing with my organization, um, which is like sending out those weekly MI tips so that it stays fresh and offering like lots of reminders and resources and opportunities for people to practice and stay oriented to this MI as a way of being, as well as a skill set. I mean, it's really a way of being. Um, and it is kind of counter instinctual for many of us. And when we get it, sort of like that training moment of like, oh, this feels really good. When we get it, it really, we feel that it, we see that it works, that it lightens our load, um, that it helps with connection and actually efficiency at supporting people with change. Then usually that's when I see people say like, I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm an MI learner for life. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a part of who you are. Right. Yes. Now I got, let's talk training. So you've mentioned wide variety of audiences who you, you train, you talked about also working with systems implementation. What do y'all got going on? What, what can our listeners sort of turn to you for some training, whether they be a leading prevention for a region? for a university or for a state or just a, a boots on the ground practitioner? Mm -hmm. I really, our organization does two things. We work directly to train staff organizations could be a short training. It could be a longer implementation. And then I'm building an online MI Academy where folks can come and from any discipline and join the online MI school, so to speak. So mm -hmm. that's where I have resource videos and live skills practice sessions um, that folks can drop in on. And you can stay for as little or as long of your MI learning journey as you'd like. You know, we offer beginning, intermediate, and advanced. Um, so that's what we have to offer. Oh, I like it. So other episodes, you've heard me say it. One of my taglines is prevention is better together and together we are stronger. You're building a community around MI, an MI recovery community uh, with that mm -hmm. ongoing support and connection. I, I know that's in the works. Um, how can folks get tapped in or get connected with you right now? Sure. Well, you found me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. at Hillary Bolter. And my website is Bolter Consulting. I'm also on Facebook. I have a private Facebook group where I do weekly lives and share as many free resources as I come across as a trainer. It's um, on Facebook. It's Motivational Interviewing Rockstars and in my resource hub. <laughs> Rockstars. Oh, I, I dig mm -hmm. it. Um, I've got a good friend and colleague out of Texas who her, her tagline is Prevention Rocks. Uh, really <laughs> brings that cool energy. I might have to connect y'all. Um, yeah, there's actually yeah. a side note. This is another free resource for folks. There's a website called Empathy Rocks, which a fellow MI trainer created as a, a practice ground for doing some of that re reflective listening and things. Um, and it's free. And then if you want to buy continuing education for your time that you're playing those empathy games, um, you can do that as well. But um, yeah, lots of amazing MI trainers out there. Um, we offer lots on our website, free resources, handouts, downloads, um, vlogs, blogs. You know, my mission is to really cultivate effective and compassionate helping professionals. And I'm trying to 
offer as many different ways to support people as possible. You, everyone, all, every one of your listeners is doing important work. You have the compassion, you're putting the hard work in there. Um, anything that I can do to support that hard work um, makes me happy. And I got to tell you that that passion, that that commitment to serving and caring comes through your social media and even more so on your website. So listeners, check the show notes, go check out her website. There's a ton of free resources on there too. Like I was blown away by all the information and resources you've got on your website. I dig it. I dig it. I do have one last question for you. This is one of my favorites for the listeners. You know, if, if they're going to remember one thing from this episode, remember this, what would that be? We cannot fix or change others. What we can do is show up in genuine, compassionate ways to help facilitate change. Wonderful. I might have to pull that out. That's a good little sound bite. Um, <laughs> oh, that my heart is filled with joy. Thank you for your time, your commitment to helping others and your time to connect today. And mm-hmm. I'm already thinking about our next episode. Uh, more to come in the future. Glad our paths have crossed and look forward to collaborating multiple ways. Together is better. We're all in this together, so we got to help each other out on this mission to serve others and create safe, healthy, happy communities. All right. Well, let's wrap this episode up. Thank you very much, Hillary, for joining me, and I will see you on Instagram. Thanks.